morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. We are live. Um, happy Friday, uh, LinkedIn. So if you're joining us, um, happy Friday. I am joining you from um, a, a, a dark studio uh, in London because we're doing some podcast recording. Emma, it looks as though you're joining me from what looks like a bookstore almost. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is our uh, sitting room, but the bookshelves did come from um, a book start in my little town of Sorbishworth. Yes. which unfortunately no longer is but we have the bookshelf oh, so that's the thing well do you know what we, we we must give a plug actually to little um independent bookstores we'll definitely have to do that so emma thank you so much for um for joining uh today we were just talking about how hectic the week's been so you know i really appreciate you taking the time out to um to have this conversation about books and book clubs Oh, well, thank you very much for inviting me. We could hardly stop talking when we got onto this topic last time. So let's I see know. how we go. Today. I know. So we <laughs> met. Um, so just for those of you that don't know, we literally met like I'm going to say, was it about two, three weeks ago? I'm going to say, I think roughly. Yeah. Um, we, are, we are both judging for the UK Business Book Awards. Shout out to the Book Awards. Um, and that's when we met. Um, but I must say, Emma, I kind of um, I'd clocked you when we had a we had a pre briefing call, um, and you talked through your experience. You, I think you mentioned book clubs then, and I thought to myself, I I must speak to Emma um, and share notes about the book club. So, do you want to just tell people what it is that you do in your day job when you're not judging for the Business Book Awards? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, essentially, I'm a writer and a journalist, um, and also to be those things, I'm a reader and a book lover. Um, in my current uh, job, I've just started. Uh, I'm on week four with the with an events company called Hive, and I am the head of content for Bet, which is a wonderful, glorious, and huge edtech conference which is happening at the end of the month in Excel. Yeah, you, I think you were just telling me, a conference for 35,000 people? Wowzers. That is pretty impressive. Oh, Emma, I I'm think we I'm sorry that, that, that I, I missed that. Oops. Yeah, a conference for 35,000 people, I think you were saying, yeah? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Emma, I think your connection might Stephen be a little bit... Stephen Bartlett cool. is our headliner. Oh, is he? Oh, interesting. I was saying, I didn't know whether your connection was slow, but it could be me. It could be me. Um, but we'll keep going. So, um, yeah, so so busy, busy life. I almost wonder how, how do you find time to read books with such a busy sort of day job? And I know that you've got a family and all of that sort of thing as well. So how do you how do you find time to read books? Um, well, I guess for me, books are um are a bit of an escape as well so it's actually my relaxed time i look forward to the end of the day when um i can go to bed and read um it does mean with book clubs so um i began a book club with my former employer um as part of the they were setting up employee resource groups and i was part of the ethnic diversity network and um, as part of that, I proposed setting up a diverse book club. And um, it was amazing. It was a fantastic experience. And although I'm only four weeks in, I'm already talking to my new employer and they seem kind of keen uh, for the idea of starting one there. So um, they're also in the process of setting up employee resource groups. Um, but yeah, so it, it, if you do a book club and you are reading books for uh, it means you can't read other books or as many other books as you as you might want so yeah. um so there is that but luckily uh most of the books that we have chosen to read have been really um really great and interesting and diversified i thought i had quite a diverse taste in books until i started up the diverse book club and i realized there's so much more diversity i could have in my life so yeah brilliant brilliant and just you know on book clubs um there, there definitely is a trend i think particularly you know sort of since 2020 there definitely is a trend to book clubs um i know of quite a few organizations that have quite well-known um leadership teams really senior teams um that actually use book clubs as a way for the leadership team to really do the learning and that curiosity together because we know that 
um, when it comes to you know diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging, and all of the different acronyms, it's really important that the leadership team almost like foster a a culture of learning. And so, what I've seen is leadership teams definitely um, all over the books. But as you say, also the employee resource groups or affinity networks, um, again using um, books. And what, why do you think that is? What what um, you know, what do you think it is that books bring into those spaces? So for particularly with the um, you know, the employee resource groups, why do you think books really sort of like work well in those spaces? Well, I think I mean it um it's it, it it's kind of inclusive by its very nature, like it's a book club, so anyone can join a book club, right? And um we made rules to make it as you know as inclusive as possible so we didn't even specify that you had to have read the book <laughs> um uh obviously if no one had read the book it would it wouldn't make for such an interesting discussion but curious people uh, were also welcome um but i think the thing about books is that you learn empathy through books you're literally putting yourself in someone else's skin and um, and that's where the magic lies, you know. My, my my daughter's just seven, and I've just signed her up. Amnesty International do this reading rebels group, so they're sending her some amazing books. And um, I mean, we've always read quite diverse books together, but um, she, you know, she is on it on so many topics because you know she's had the experience through through books. So. Um, uh, so yeah, so I think another thing as well is the way we did it anyway, was it brought together different, you know, it, it kind of crosses business lines, regions. So it's, um, you know, really bringing people together across the business who might not necessarily otherwise meet. So Yeah, no, that's, that's brilliant. I mean, I think I, you know, I'm a massive fan of book clubs. I first started running book clubs and, and first of all, I started running them for a women's network like, 10 years ago you know over 10 years ago I, I started running book clubs so I've just it's something that I always go back to both in terms of you know connecting with I think it's really good for human connection you know connecting with other humans over stories um, because that's how we're kind of you know as humans that's how we've always communicated you know through the ages so connecting with other humans over stories and then you know in some organizations I've then facilitated book clubs for employee resource groups but I love something that you said which is um you know that you've you've made it so inclusive that somebody doesn't even necessarily have to have read the book which is great they're almost the best book clubs aren't they you know that people can still <laughs> feel that they can come into that space and still join in the conversation yeah well I mean in my last employer was a big uh, infrastructure group so these are you know um a lot of engineer type people who don't necessarily read fiction um as a general rule and um we set one of the rules that books had to be fiction a lot of people proposed some amazing non-fiction mm -hmm. uh books but the people who kind of were at the beginning of the book club they wanted it to be fiction so you know I don't think there's you know both have merits um but we chose to do it fiction and I think um for people who don't read a lot of uh, fiction that could be a barrier but we um uh we we tried we kind of we aligned ourselves with different ERGs so it started with the ethnic diversity network as uh, ACOM was setting up other ERGs, Pride and Gender, we um, joined forces with them and chose books together with them. And um, we also tried to align for different events. So, you know, it was Southeast Asian History Month. So we chose a book by um, a Southeast Asian author set in Southeast Asia. Um, we did uh, when the um, uh, war in ukraine started we looked for a U ukrainian author um who was still based in ukraine yeah um we had a colleague join from the philippines and um so we talked with her, her, that was that was interesting because we had to make sure the books were equally available in the philippines mm -hmm. and uh, over here but we found the book together um so 
um, and we tried different times of the the day. So we're always looking to find it to to, to make it something that would be um, uh, that would kind of complement other things. In in Black History Month, we had an author. We had Louise Hare came to talk about this lovely city. Um, uh, so it, that, that's another um, kind of top tip yeah. if you're um, if you because the book club is something kind of regular. Yeah. If you can align to um, you know something else that's happening, so you kind of boost each other. Um, yeah. That's a great way to um, uh, to kind of build momentum and and yeah. and introduce um, the the club to more people. Yeah, um, yeah that, probably that's a key really... top tip though. Is yeah, I was I was going to say uh, just I was just going to say just before you move on, Emma, that because you made a couple of really good points there that I don't I don't want to lose. So the first one that you said was like aligning it to you know certain days or special events. So I would say things like you know so using um, you know the awareness days or inclusion calendars. There's all sorts of ones out there. You know, um, you can kind of you know almost like find out what's happening. So for example, you know we're we're now in. Uh, Women's History Month um, and so yeah you can always like theme the books around you know those almost like the inclusion calendar if I call it that so that's a really good tip um, because it's it's uh, you're kind of going in slightly more deeper than just if you just have like an awareness day and there's a talk or something books make you really dive into like lived experience and then um, the other point you made was about getting the author um, along as well which is something that I always think is amazing and I think we'd probably be surprised how accessible um, authors are um, you know particularly yeah. if the book is relatively new those authors will will love it and actually even if it's an older book the authors probably love the fact that somebody's still reading it and talking about it and all of those things so two absolutely amazing tips you know tie it in with the inclusion calendar and invite the authors you know just reach out to them they'll love it that their book is still being promoted yeah yeah and and i mean i um sort of happen to know someone who knew louise but um you know authors if you want to find authors on twitter um yeah. uh that yeah like you said the most are very very accessible yeah. um yeah and the, the the other top tip i was going to say is um aligning yourself with internal comms. I mean, it depends on your size of the organization. You might have a small organization and that might not be an issue, but um, I worked for ACOM, it's a big 50,000 person company. Um, and getting the message out there um, was kind of key. Lots of people were like, oh, I didn't know you were doing a book club. I would have loved to have done that. So we, um, we worked with internal comms to promote the events. Um, as I said, aligning with other things that were going on also helped kind of boost that. And then we discovered the office manager network. So it's also about finding out which of the internal comms are most read. Um, and uh, so we found the office um, manager network uh, really useful. Yeah. And um, yeah. So. Yeah, that's brilliant. And you know what? And, and as you say, aligning it with internal comms and you know, the book club, you know, because when we think about, sort of just taking it back slightly, when we think about things like these awareness days or inclusion months, often we think, oh, it's got to be big budget, you know, you've got to get a speaker in, all of those sorts of things. But a book club is such a, it's such a rich kind of, you know, event and a rich interaction. And it costs like hardly anything, you know, unless you're, even if you're buying the books for the colleagues, it doesn't really even cost that much. It's, you know, it really is such a good way Um as you say, like aligning with um, what the organisation's doing. But you're yeah, a great tip in terms of getting, you know, your comms person on board or if there's a staff newsletter that goes out or whatever, giving people plenty of notice. How, how much time do you allow people for reading the books? Well, we, I mean, we would have uh, meetings spaced monthly. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, we'd have at least a month. Yeah. Um, but we did try to... Um, select a couple of books at a time so people could um, have more time if they if they needed. Um, yeah, and we tried to choose them together. Um, so at, at the you know we'd have a sort of initial discussion at the sort of present book club, and then that might continue a little bit. We might sort of you know um, gauge opinion further afield. 
um, one other rule that we brought in was we had um, a suggestion of an amazing book uh, by an Iranian author. Um, and there were two translations of that book that we didn't know at the time because nobody had read the book. They just heard of it and thought it sounded really interesting. And I think both of them were kind of um, you know, kind of reads that I would classify, you know, worthy but a little inaccessible to very busy people. And one in particular was really hard, was, was was quite a hard read. So it was worth it. It was a great book, but that could put some people off, particularly people who aren't used to reading uh, um, a lot of fiction. So we introduced a new rule, which was that uh, to propose a book, you had to have read it and um, and it had to be relatively accessible for all readers. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree with that. I tend to, um, probably because I consume a lot of audiobooks anyway. So when, I, when I'm when i searching for books for book clubs and even the ones that I recommend, so people will see me recommend books generally at least once a month on LinkedIn. And you would tend to notice that the books I recommend, there's always, as you say, they're quite accessible and there's always an audiobook version um, for me because for me that that makes it the most accessible. You know, if there is a print, and audio um that that kind of ticks a lot of boxes especially for people that are quite busy which i know um for example you know obviously a lot of um senior people are quite busy so i always go for something that's got an audio book as well to sort of just anything to remove the barriers right to people actually being able to get into the book let's just talk about the the pros and cons of the fiction versus non-fiction because what, what's really interesting and um you know when we first met and you said about the fact that all of your books are fiction you know in the kind of like inclusion book club I was almost I was quite surprised and I think that's because so when I used to do book clubs sort of outside of the corporate space they were pretty much all fiction and I could I couldn't really get that group to read non-fiction the, the odd time that I tried um it really wasn't very popular they just love fiction so there was something about so the message I took away from that was when people are wanting to wind down and just take leisure time they want to read fiction um, but in the corporate space and in the book clubs I run, you know, for corporates and the book clubs I run now, because um, I, you know, I sort of often I'll dive into a topic and I invite a select group of people to sort of delve into books. And they're, they're always nonfiction. So I have quite, yeah, in terms of around, around this topic, I always go in nonfiction. But I love the fact that you're using fiction, um, you know, in, in DNI book club. Just ex just explain um you know, what you think the pros and cons are and why you've kind of stuck to that, you know, sort of fiction rather than non-fiction? Um, so I think, I mean, there's merits in both. I read fiction and non-fiction. I think, I do think there is something about fiction where you literally get in the skin of someone else. Yeah. And, um, you know, the non-fiction tends to often be like there's one thing that the book's trying to say and the rest of the book is building up to that kind of argument. Yeah. Sometimes it's several things. Um, uh, and, you know, some of those books are, 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 are you know, for, you know, for example, like, um, uh, I'm no longer talking to white people about race is one of the, yeah. uh, books that's really changed my life you know um my husband's from Uganda and before I read that book when he talked to me about sort of minor racist incidents that had happened I would kind of naturally without realizing I was doing it have a tendency to maybe kind of downplay them sort mm -hmm. of like oh thank goodness that is doesn't happen very often kind of um uh, uh dialogue because I guess I didn't you know, didn't want to um, think to, I didn't want, I was upset about the fact that this was the world that we have to live in. Yeah. Um, and after reading that book, I realized that, you know, that that was not a helpful approach. You know, if someone hits your your child at school, you don't say, oh, well, thank goodness that that doesn't happen very often. So definitely, like, I'm a big fan of nonfiction. But um, I think I've mentioned it to you when we were talking before. 
uh, there's a book called Homegoing by Yaa Gayasi. Um, that's an amazing book, an amazingly ambitious book as well. I, I'm kind of sickeningly jealous that she wrote it in her 20s and it's so, uh, uh, you know, so amazing. But it, it traces its two um, half-sisters who never knew each other. Um, and it was inspired by her going to the um, to Cape Coast, which is one of the uh, slave trading outposts in Ghana. Um, and a place I've been, and you can feel the history there. Um, it's a very moving place. And um, so she learned when she was there that some of the commanders took local wives. So she has um, these two sisters, one who's a slave and one who's the daughter of um, one of the slave traders. And each chapter is a different person tracing the history. And that is the most, you, that is the most powerful book I've ever read um, that's showing, rather than telling, showing the impact that slavery still has today. Um, so when people say it's something that happened in the past, it, uh, uh, um, no, it's something that's still having effects today. And uh, that for me really brought it home that, you know, there's so much left to unpack there still um, in a way that perhaps a non-fiction book, um, uh, I mean, Non-fiction books are, are telling it, and uh, um, rather than making you feel it, I think. A hundred, I, yeah, absolutely. I think you've, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head there. Um, and I think there's something about you know when we when we think about this whole topic of of inclusion in particular, you know, you're wanting people have to feel it. You know, you have to get you have to get people at a heart level rather than just a head level. And I think you're absolutely right that one what nonfiction does, and maybe this is maybe it's my accountant's brain that kind of you know veers towards the nonfiction, you know, because it tends to be. And I, I really love nonfiction books that are quite scientific based, you know, and they really boil it down and they bring a lot of research and evidence into it and all of that stuff. I mean, I do still love the the sort of like you know the lived experiences in those collections, but I think you're absolutely right. The nonfiction is is probably more at the head level. But actually, as you say, the fiction, especially when it's like a really compelling story, really can get to the heart, uh, you know, the emotional side and kind of really create that empathy, um, perhaps in a way that nonfiction can't. I, w I wonder whether, because um, some of the other books that I recommend, along with the nonfiction, which I wonder whether this um, maybe sort of goes some way to, to almost like a, a kind of meeting the middle, is I really like, um, I think I was talking to you uh, when we met at Judging Day, these essay collections, you know, so where it's essay collections of, you know, individuals from a, a certain background and they're kind of like, you know, sharing their lived experience. Um, I guess that's almost like a halfway house, but probably still not quite as um, in-depth, pro probably, you know, as a as a, a complete sort of fiction novel. So, um, yeah, you, you've really made me think about um, about doing book clubs with fiction Re really made me think about it, yeah. Well, it'd be interesting uh, to know more about the work you do with um, senior senior leaders and, you know, how they respond, because it go mm. goes to that sort of very busy people, how to make time for books in life. And I mm. think sometimes fiction, because you have to enter someone else's world, if you're very busy and very distracted, the kind of uplift of getting into that world can be a little bit higher. I mean, totally worth it when you're in there. Um, but that's why we came up with a rule about sort of making the books accessible in terms of, um, you know, not too difficult to 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 get into. But it'd be interesting how um, senior leaders responded to fiction versus nonfiction. Yeah, yeah I'm I'm trying to even think, um, and maybe you know, maybe we. We sometimes forget that senior leaders are human, don't we? Do you know what I mean? We, we kind of, you know, the more senior somebody gets, we kind of we assume that they're so serious, you know, because I because I'm I'm even, you know, I'm kind of imagining so so in the conversations that I've had about things like book clubs and when I've read book clubs, I'm imagining the response of like senior leaders, you know, when you say to them, Well, you know, the, the first book that we're gonna do is fiction and what that response would be. But but I think there is something about sometimes we just take ourselves too seriously almost. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, often, actually, uh, you know, some of the books that I recommend, depend, I, it always depends on where the leadership team is. So some of the books that I start with, depending on where the leadership team is, is books like um, 
you know, thinking fast and slow, which very much is a head book. You know, it's very, it's very kind of in the head, um, sort of about bias. And then, you know, Rebel Ideas, The Power of Diverse Thinking by Matthew Sire. So those two books in particular, I often start with. And then going into the lived experience, um, the books that I think do really well, actually, um, The Good Immigrant, um, which is this collection of essays. And there's a, there's a UK version um, and a US version. So, you know, and I've done book clubs on both. Um, the UK version, you know, the feedback I've had from leaders is um, they actually found it quite quite challenging almost to to read. You know, it's reading the experiences typically of people that were first and second generation immigrants to the UK um, over, you know, the last kind of 20 or 30 years or so. Um, so, you know, definitely has that impact. And then the Good Immigrant USA, um, again, first and second gen immigrants to the USA, but also has a slightly broader sort of global appeal. But um I'm, I'm definitely going to start putting the feelers out um, about taking fiction, you know, even into those leadership groups, because actually, you know, something you said about, um, you know, almost like, um, you know, you talked about books being a way of relaxing and, and all of those sorts of things. There are definitely some kind of well-being almost benefits to it. And, and you know, what leadership teams don't need to, to, to actually take a bit of downtime. So, you know, there may be something about the, the fiction books that actually, serves more than one purpose you know it kind of does that driving the conversations but also just gives them a little bit of downtime and a little bit of escapism maybe from the day job yeah and maybe poetry as well which is something that um you know some people think is quite inaccessible as well but I think it's just a knowledge thing and that we don't um or I think we're starting to read more, but we, you know, um, poetry books are harder to to find. I remember I had to choose a poem at school and I think we had like, you know, one collected book of poems, none of which I liked in my parents' bookshelf, you know. Um, I know a few more now, but um, yeah, poetry is a way of, um, especially for time poor, you know, you've got just you know a, a couple of minutes you can sit down and read a, a a poem and and useful for discussion as well so that's um that's maybe yeah. also something to think that's about. really yeah that's really interesting I've not really ever thought about that one either I, you know I love that, that you come at it from um different perspectives so obviously that you know the writer's gift um the other the other type of book club I've heard about obviously they're not books but um I've heard of people doing book clubs about TED talks you know, so somebody picks a particular TED talk, you know, and then they watch it and come together and um, a similar sort of concept. But um, my final question for you before we wrap up, um, when do when do you tend to run the book club? So is it some is it like a lunch break type thing? Is it I know you mentioned you're in your organisation before it was global. So there's maybe something about how you manage that. But typically during the day, when did it kind of work best for you to schedule the book clubs in for people? Yeah, well, I mean, it was a global company, but we were divided by regions. So it was the Europe region. Um, we tried to, when we discovered a colleague was calling in from the Philippines, we tried to kind of make an accessible time. Um, but then it turned out that they were actually working on kind of European or US um, time 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 frames. So yeah, so we stuck to the European day. Uh, we started during COVID, so we had um, calls at uh, at six o'clock, um, and that worked really well during COVID. Um, then we noticed that um, after COVID, that um, started to be a less successful time. Six o'clock is just like that's when people are kind of leaving the office, so either you kind of need to go a bit earlier or a bit later. Um, we tried uh, with um, lunchtime meetings, and I don't know if we that necessarily settled on what was going to be the best formula. We were still sort of doing the post-COVID testing. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah. In my in my new in my new company, we, we tend to they're encouraged to come in the office uh, twice a week. It's mostly on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I would imagine a lunchtime on a Tuesday or a Thursday, mm -hmm. that's when they tend to put on um, other kinds of talks. Yeah. So I think that that would probably work best. So it depends yeah. on your organisation. Yeah, yeah, I guess it does. Yeah, I like, yeah, I, I definitely like the idea of a lunchtime thing, although I guess it depends on um, the workplace culture because not, not every workplace has a culture of, 
you know, we down tools for an hour, you know, some people, you know, rightly or wrongly have kind of almost like more of a work through culture. So yeah, maybe, maybe sort of after, after work, but something to try out definitely. Um, thank you so much, um, Emma. Any final tips for anybody that's maybe thinking about starting a book club? To, to kind of motivate them. Go, and, go and do it if you're thinking about it go and do it but find some like-minded book people because you're going to run out of energy if it's just you um there's going to be things about it that you like and don't like so my um uh sort of you know remembering to get the advert the, the announcement out on time and all of that that wasn't like the thing that's my most favorite thing to do but I had you know kind of a group of like-minded people and we would sort of share those those things about and we started um uh working with the other ERGs as well which was great so there were other people who could choose the book and take the lead and and, and all of that so yeah find a, a few book lovers and yeah. go for it yeah, find some of the bookworms to help sort of lessen the, the load. Because obviously, you know, people have got a day job to do as well. But yeah, amazing. All right, that's brilliant. Thank you, Emma, so much for joining us. Where can people connect and find you online if they want to? Is LinkedIn the best place? Or are you on Twitter or Insta? What's Where are you, where are you generally? Yeah, I'm LinkedIn, Emma Van Door, V-A-N-D-O-R-E. Um, there's not many Van Doors, so I should be quite easy to find. Um, or I'm Emissima, so E-M-M-I-S-S-I-M-A on Twitter and on Insta. Perfect. Emma, thank you so much for joining us. Have have a great thank weekend. You. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And get, get going with those book clubs. I hope we've inspired you today. All right. Thanks, Emma. Thanks.